Well, 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 ladies and gentlemen, it is an awesome honor and privilege to have you here at God Squad Church. My name is Pastor Susie, and I'm the lead pastor and founder here, and we want to welcome you, okay? I'm looking at the chat, seeing some familiar names that I know and love. Welcome, welcome, welcome. But also right now, can we spam some hearts in the chat for anyone that might be joining us for the first time? We love getting the chance to connect with new people. Hopefully, you'll jump in the Discord, whether this is pre-recorded later on YouTube or you're watching live. We'd love to get you involved in the community. Love to get the chance to get to know you, and seriously, welcome, welcome, okay? Next week is a very special week for me, okay? There's going to be one day next week that's going to be a game changer for me. Next Thursday is the release of the PlayStation 5, okay? Never in my life have I had a day one console. Never. I've never once, ever, ever, ever had a brand new console on the first day released. But yes, get your sins and your envy and your jealousy out now and you can repent in this service because I am getting my hands on a PlayStation 5 day one. Okay, I sat at the computer and I spammed refresh over and over and over and over again until finally, praise the good Lord Almighty, I got a PS5. Cost me 500 bucks, but it was worth every penny, okay? Because I'm going to stream it. Hopefully, uh, we'll reach some new people. Maybe Lyric will throw me a host for like 30,000 people. We'll share the gospel. It'll be worth every penny, okay? But this is a big deal for me because, like I said, I've never had a day one console. So I've already cleared my calendar. Next Thursday, November 12th, Pastor Tammy, ain't nothing getting in my way of playing the PS5. I mean, I've, I've moved meetings. I've done everything I can. Nothing is going to stop me from playing PlayStation 5 and streaming it next Thursday, November 12th. The only thing that I wouldn't let stop me, the only thing that I wouldn't let stop happening on November 12th is if somebody in our church needed care. If somebody needed prayer, if somebody needed to talk to, on November 12th, the day of PS5, then Pastor Balls would love to spend some time with you, okay? Because I'm going to be playing PlayStation 5, praise God, just kidding. You, well, kind of, sort of. I love all of you, okay? Here's the deal, friends. It's a big day. It's a big, big day for the PS5, but it's a sad day for the PS4. It's a sad day for the PS4, because what's going to happen next Thursday is that the PS4, unfortunately, is going to get left behind. Okay? There's a meme you're going to see on the screen that maybe some of you have seen at some point. And when you see this picture, you, you've probably seen it. Okay? I want to clarify one thing when this picture comes on screen. Here it is right here. Okay? One, I want to clarify that he is looking at the back of her head. Praise God. Let's just get that out of the way. Okay? But you've seen this meme okay? where obviously there's a guy that represents us and he's the person that he's currently with. Okay? And then there's another girl who to him might be someone a little bit prettier, a little bit better. To him, this girl might be an upgrade. And this meme has been used for so many different things, but how many of y'all know that on Thursday, November 12th, this next picture is going to be the truth for the PS4, okay? The PS4 is going to get left behind, and the PS5 is going to be all that people care about. It's going to be all that people care about. PS4 is going to be old news, outdated hardware, only plays at 60 frames? Are you kidding me? We're living in a world of 120 FPS nowadays. Well, at least most games can play up to 120. I can't wait to see how many games actually play 120. But PS4, it's going to be old news. Nobody's going to care about the PS4 anymore. You ever notice how, like, really old games are cool and really new games are cool? But games that are just, like, somewhere in the middle, they're just lame. Like, who plays three-year-old games? You know what I mean? That game is so three years ago. Retro games are awesome, right? You play like super old Zelda games in like 8-bit whatever, right? Playing the new games are cool, but then if you just play like a four-year-old game, like dude, this, this game's dead, bro. Like who plays Overwatch? You know what I mean? Most people are like Overwatch, like who cares? I actually happen to like Overwatch, but you know what I'm saying, it's the stigma. The games in the middle are just kind of lame, and unfortunately soon that will be the PS4, okay? But here's the thing. With that picture, you've seen this happen in many things in life. Something new comes along, something different comes along, and whatever was old is just old news. It's going to happen to the PS4, it's inevitable, and it is absolutely okay to upgrade your console. But it is not okay to upgrade your king. As followers of Jesus, when something different comes along, when something new comes along, it takes our affection. It takes our attention. You see that picture. I want it back on the screen. You see when the PS5 comes out, the PS4 is old news. But if you'll be honest with this next picture, how many times have you done this? Where Jesus, the center of your life, 
He's the center of your affection, the center of your attention, but then something different comes along, and it takes your eyes. It takes your affection. Maybe it's been something like the next picture. Maybe it wasn't for you a PS5. Maybe it was a girlfriend. Maybe you, you, you really loved Jesus, but then you realized that actually you were just lonely. You weren't looking for a savior. You were actually just looking for a spouse. What about the next one? Maybe you've done this. Maybe you were just looking for a promotion, and you realized that you needed Jesus, but then you realized that you were actually just looking for a paycheck and not a provider. Something new came along. I needed Jesus until something new came along. Something different came along. And in 2020, we've done a lot of upgrading. Let me explain to you what an upgrade is. An upgrade is something newer, better, that you have made a decision to walk away from what you currently had to go to something that you realize you wanted more. And it doesn't even always have to be more money. You maybe have left a job behind that paid good money so that you could do a job that you just loved more. You're willing to take less so that you could have more affection towards what you were doing. But for you, the passion is the upgrade. You left something behind to go to something different, and to you that was an upgrade. But the upgrade doesn't always have to be better. How many of y'all know that in 2020, many of us have upgraded our joy for sorrow? Well, Pastor Susie, sorrow's not an upgrade. I know it's not. So why have we done it? We have upgraded our peace for fear. We've been so focused on who will be the president of the United States, we've taken our focus off who already is the king of the universe. And we've allowed our focus to be taken away from things because they're new and they're different. And we've allowed circumstances and other things to take the place of Jesus in our hearts. And we haven't just upgraded our consoles We think that we've upgraded our king. And we've allowed things to take that passion that we once had, to take that affection that we once had, and now something new has come along, and we're on to something different. And what I want to do today is I want to read to you a passage of Scripture from the book of Revelation. I want to read to you a few different verses that I think the author John is going to help us understand and really give us a heart check to help us see, have you lost your affection for Jesus? And have you attempted to upgrade your king? I want to read to you Revelation 2, 1 through 7. It starts off like this. To the angel of the church in Ephesus, I write, These are the words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand and walks among the seven golden lampstands. I know your deeds and your hard work and your perseverance, and I know that you cannot tolerate wicked people, that you have tested those who claim to be apostles but are not, and have found them false. You have persevered and have endured hardship for my name and have not grown weary. Yet I hold this against you. You have forsaken the love you had at first. Consider how far you have fallen. Repent and do the things you did at first. If you do not repent, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place. Jumping to verse 7. Whoever has ears... Let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches, to the one who is victorious, and I will give you the right to eat from the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. We see starting off with this passage that God is commending and complimenting this church for doing a lot of really good things. They've persevered through hardship, they've served people, they've helped people, they've done a lot of really, really good things, and God starts off this conversation with like, thumbs up. I'm proud of you for the great things you've done here, right? It's like last week. Waymaker Week was insane. And we hit the goal, and God is so proud of this church for the sacrifices that you've made and all the things that you've done. But how many of y'all know that you can do the right thing for the wrong reasons? And this passage starts off where God is saying, you've done all the right things. You've endured hardship. You've helped others in need but you haven't done it for the right reasons. It's like when you've had a conversation with someone, especially if you're an employer or a friend or a spouse, and you need to have a difficult conversation with someone you love. If you've gotten pretty good at decent social skills, you'll probably start that conversation off with, I just want you to know the things that I love and appreciate about about you. I just want you to know that you're a great wife to our children, and you, you do such a great job for caring for us in the home, but 
There's the big but that no one likes, okay? But this. You know, you've been really working hard, extra hours, you're an employer, complimenting your employee, and you're doing all these great things, but, and this passage starts off that way, this is the great things you've done as a church, Ephesus, but you've forgotten about me. You've forgotten about your love for Jesus. The church just can't be a place full of nice people doing good things. That's not the church. Some people that work in charitable organizations, which are incredible, love charity, love what AGDQ does every year, love what Dr. Lupo does for charity. Charities are absolutely imperative and important, but no one that ever works for a charitable organization would say like, oh yeah, well, we're basically a church. They would never say that. They were like, no, of course they understand a charity is not the same thing as a church. A charity would never confuse itself for a church, but I think sometimes the church confuses itself for a charity. I think sometimes it's like, well, I mean, we're helping people. We're doing good things. We hit Waymaker goal. So God must be so proud. But if we'll be honest, for some of us, I think God would say, I'm so proud of the things you've done. But some of you have forgotten about me. Some of you have abandoned your first love. You're doing the right things, but maybe not for the right reasons. And I believe in this passage, John labels out three things that we can do to really check our hearts to see if we've forgotten our love for God and to see if we've upgraded. I want to read to you again verse number four. Yet I hold this against you. You have forsaken the love you had at first. I think the first thing that John is calling us to do is to remember. How many of y'all can remember the day that you said yes to follow Jesus? I remember the day. Like, I remember the day. I grew up in church my whole life. I, like, kind of believed, sort of believed I was involved. I sat in the back row, and then when I wasn't sat in the back row, the sad thing is I was actually playing drums on the worship team, barely knew if I believed in God, wrestling with it, living a sinful lifestyle that I shouldn't have, was in and out all at the same time. But I remember one Sunday morning, I started going to a different church that was actually in English because I grew up in a Portuguese-speaking church, which is part of the barrier and the language barrier of why I never really fully like, understood what faith was all about because I was learning the Bible and learning like, Portuguese language at the same time. So my pastor would say something, and I would literally be like, I don't actually know what you just said. And it wasn't even because he just said some big Bible word. He just said a Brazilian word, and I was like, I don't know what you just said. So like, really struggled to learn the language. So I started attending an English-speaking church, and I remember one Sunday where the pastor preached this anointed message, and for the first time in my life, it just clicked, and it made sense. And I remember going down on the altar, crying, finally realizing and acknowledging how much I needed Jesus, and it shifted the trajectory of my life, and I've never been the same. I can remember when I first gave my life to follow Jesus. I was so full of joy. I woke up every single morning, literally would go on Facebook, and I would pray, God, who can I tell about Jesus today? That was back when Facebook was cool for people our age, okay? I'd go on Facebook, who can I tell today? I remember going to the grocery store. God, put a really hurting guy in front of me who's stuck in a really long line, who's having a really bad day that I can talk with and tell about Jesus. Maybe you remember your day. When you gave your life to follow Jesus, and you were full of passion, full of hope, it was like when you finally unboxed your new PS5. On that day one, baby, so excited. People are going to do unboxings. They're going to put them on YouTube. I mean, it's such a historic moment that people are going to go on YouTube and watch somebody else take a PlayStation out of a box, and it's going to get millions of views. It's it's just, it's going to happen. People already asked my stream today, are you doing an unboxing? Like, like, you really want to watch me, like, unpack the box? Like, no, we don't even care about the gameplay. What's in the box? (laughs) Day one is a big deal, and it gets remembered forever. Man, I remember the first time I got a PS5. I remember the first time I built my PC. I remember, I remember, I remember. But what's going to happen on day one, next week, November 12th, is that there's a spot on your desk where your PS4 is currently. It's been there for so long, there's probably dust, Doritos underneath it, I mean, all kinds of nasty stuff, because you haven't moved it, because it's been a shrine for the past several years. 
And it's there. It's on your desk. But then come next Thursday, you're going to unplug that HDMI, you're going to pick it up, and you're just going to lightly toss it on the couch next to you because, boom, here's the PS5. And you're going to unbox that thing so slowly, probably record it, put it on YouTube, and then where that PS4 once was, now your PS5 will be, and the PS5 is going to be the most glorious thing you've ever seen. 120 frames. It's the color white, which I love, okay? The new controller. I mean, it's going to be amazing. And it's all going to be about the PS5. But don't forget that the same emotion, attachment, hype, and excitement that you have for that PS5 is the same feeling that you had for that PS4 that now you just threw off to the side. Well, it's just a few years old now. No big deal. But don't you remember when you had the same feeling about the PS4 that you do now about the PS5? But now what used to be the greatest thing you've ever seen, 60 frames, PS4, a little touch analog thing in the control. This is the greatest thing I've ever seen. Now it's just old news. Now it, it's not so cool anymore. Now 60 frames is like, it's 2020. Who's playing at 60 frames? You don't have a 144 hertz monitor. But like, these are the things that as new things come out, the old just becomes old. I can remember when I built my first ever streaming PC. And back then, I had a 970 graphics card. Back then, I think it was lit, okay? It wasn't a 980, it wasn't a budget, but it was a 970, okay? But here we are, that was five and a half, six years ago, maybe. Now I've got a 2070, the 3090s are coming out. So now what used to be like treasure is now like, bro, you have a 970? What I used to stream on and reach thousands of people on, now that streaming computer is my wife's office computer for emails and Google Sheets and Google Docs, and which is feeling fancy, Google Excel, whatever it's called. Well, it used to be the best gaming PC on the market. Now it just answers emails and does documents and has Discord meetings. Because what used to be so amazing is now just old news. But my prayer is that the story of Jesus, that the gospel will never become old news. It always remains good news. You remember the day you opened your PS4. You built your new PC. You remember the day that you bought your brand new car. And nobody was allowed to eat in it. But now you're like throwing trash in the back. You got ice creams on your console in the middle. Like it's all kinds of nasty. But on day one, you remember <sighs> that new car smell. You remember. But do you remember when you gave your life to follow Jesus? And how much passion you had? how much hope you had, how you realized that you had found the greatest truth the world had ever seen and you needed to tell everyone about it. And I think if Jesus were to stand before some of us today, he would ask the question, what happened? What happened? That PS4 that was so special, you just unplugged it, threw it on the couch, you didn't even put it back in the box because you threw that box away. And now it's all about the PS5. But don't you remember the day that I set you free? Don't you remember the day that I forgave you of your sins, where I purchased for you eternal life, where you were blind, but that I helped you to once see, where your chains of addiction were broken, where I healed you of your sickness? What happened to your gratitude? What happened to your passion? What happened to your love for me? Something different came along, and you've just upgraded to what you feel like was better? What happened to how you used to be so hungry to read, to read the Word of God? Man, I can't go to sleep until I've read it. What happened to the days where, man, you used to pray, and you would get lost in prayer? Three hours has gone by? I gotta pick my kids up from school. You just got lost in His presence. You, you, you were just lost because you loved Jesus. What happened? What happened to your heart? What happened to your affection? God says to this church, you've done so many great, so many great things, yet you have forgotten your love for me. Look, look at verse 5. It says, consider how far you have fallen. 
And I don't just want you to consider how far you have fallen, but I want you to consider how you have fallen. What, what happened? How did we get from this is the greatest thing I've ever experienced, the good news, to just old news? PS5 is here. Let's get rid of the PS4. W- what happened? How, how did we get here? Maybe some of you remember that old song, Jesus, Jesus, lover of my soul. Jesus, I will never let you go. But then we did. But then we did. At one moment, we were like, Jesus, I will never let you. PS5? Something new comes. We're like spiritual squirrels. Something great comes around. We're like, oh, PS5? GTX, RTX 970? What? That's old news. 3090? Girlfriend? You got the leash on it, you know what I'm saying? Like something new comes around, and now all of a sudden your attention is just like everywhere. But there was a point in your life where nothing took your eyes off Jesus. There was a moment for you where you truly grasped and understood a portion of the greatness of God. But then we've allowed our affection to be elsewhere. What happened? I hope today that Jesus is putting in your heart to remember, maybe for some of us, the way we once felt and asking ourselves, why don't we feel that way anymore? If Jesus hasn't changed, why have my love for him? The second thing I think the scripture wants us to understand is not just to remember, but to repent. Read verse five with me. Consider how far you have fallen. Repent and do the things you did at first. If you do not repent, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place. See what happens in church when we talk about this passage or we talk about our love for Jesus. We're all sitting there going, man, I really hope this message is hitting home for somebody. Man, I really, really hope that somebody's catching this today. But we don't want to admit it might be me. It might be me. But of course I'm still in love with Jesus. I've been in church all this time. I believe that you can walk away from Christ without walking away from the church. You can sit in the back row. Your body is present in the church, but your heart is elsewhere. My affection, my love is not on Jesus anymore, but I show up on Saturdays. You know, I, I throw up God's Squad Church on my second monitor while I'm gaming. You know, I mean, it's no big deal. Jesus is my king, but he doesn't even get main monitor. Like literally in your display settings, there's a main monitor option. And the word of God doesn't even get to be on it. Oh, it's throw up my secondary monitor. My third, I got five monitors. Let me put you on my fifth monitor. And we think because we're still involved, because we're still plugged in, that we haven't allowed our affection to fail. We hear these kind of messages and we think, man, I really hope some people are catching this. But what if who needs to catch it is me? What if who needs to catch it is me? What if my affection for Jesus has failed, and the first thing that I need to do is repent. And I need to get honest with God and say, God, check my heart. Is it me? Because if you can remember the way you used to be about your affection towards Jesus, when you prayed all the time, read his word, were full of joy, told your friends about Jesus, and you're not still there, then it's, then it's you. We need to be honest with ourselves and ask God to help us repent and to acknowledge that first, it might might be me. I've been serving in church and volunteering and sacrificing, giving my money and this and that, but where is my heart? God says, you can do all the good things. I mean, they, they persevered through hardship in his name. They did all the right things, yet my gripe against you is you have forgotten your first love. I wonder for many of us, are we still doing the right things? Being in church, giving our money. I even upped my money during Waymaker Week. But we really did it because 
the alternative of like not hitting the goal would have been a super buzz kill. Or we did it because it was hype, or I wanted to see Pastor Tammy eat some dog food. Remember, those are the rewards, but they're not, they're not the reason. And we need to reach a place in our heart where a portion of the word repentance means being willing to acknowledge and apologize to God. We're going to get to the second portion in a few minutes. But the first portion is acknowledging, this could be me. This letter wasn't written to me. I don't live in Ephesus. But this, this could be me. This could be me. And I need to consider how far I've fallen. And I need to repent. The second part of verse 5, I want to throw it up on the screen again. Is repent and do the things you did at first. And if you do not repent, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place. The scripture was addressed at the very beginning. I read it to you. It said, these are the words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand and walks among the seven golden lampstands. There's so much conversation around what this means but the largest school of belief is that the seven stars represent the pastors that lead the church and the seven lampstands represent the churches themselves but not the building not not the live stream not the domain the people and god says if you do not repent i will remove the lampstand from its place we talked about a few weeks ago at judgment day where people will be separated by Christ on the right and on the left. And the right will inherit the kingdom of God and go to heaven. And the left, God says, depart from me, doer of wickedness. And then the people on the left were confused. And, and, and they, said, they said, Jesus, wait, when, when did I see you? Thirsty and need a drink. I'll tell you, this, Jesus, what happened? How, how did I end up on the left? But I was, I was in church. I, I was giving my money. And I was serving. And I was Matty Ice behind the camera. How am I on the left? What happened? I think Jesus might say to you, what happened? Don't you remember when you left me? Don't you remember the things I've done for you? and your devotion to me. And over years, somehow they just faded away. You maybe never stopped going to church, but somewhere along the way, you stopped loving God. And the church is not meant for people that just want to do good things and be good citizens in society. That's a great part. But we do not get to heaven by being good people. We are not good people, which is why we need the forgiveness of God, because we have sinned, and all have fallen short of the glory of God. All of us, me included. I'm, I'm no better than you. But Jesus says, if you will simply become a group of people who do nice things for other people, and that's all this is about, and you don't love me, and serve me, and devote your life to me, I will remove the lampstand from its place. I want you to understand today, God, God doesn't want to remove you. He loves you more than you could ever imagine. That's why he gave his son Jesus to die on the cross for you, to forgive you of your sins. That he died and three days later he rose from the grave so that all who call upon the name of Jesus could be forgiven, saved, and have eternity in heaven. But God doesn't want to remove you from his kingdom. He doesn't want to remove you. He loves you. And as gamers, when something's not working the way that it should, sometimes we start thinking about upgrades. Especially if you're someone like me, who's not very tech savvy. I mean, when my computer starts lagging on stream, I'm like, guys, my computer, it's dying. It's getting old. It's time for an upgrade. I need a 3090. It's time for an upgrade, because I have no idea what I'm doing. And then the chat starts asking, did you update your drivers? Did, did you download the newest update? And so here's what we start thinking as gamers sometimes. Well, my PC is not acting the way that it should, so let me just take a piece out, 
Let me remove it and upgrade it with something else. I want you to know God doesn't want to upgrade you, but he does want to update you. Our hearts are not hardware issues. God is not going to take out your heart and give you a new one. It's not an issue of hardware. It's an issue of software. God wants to download and shift the software of your soul so that you love him. He doesn't want to upgrade you. He doesn't want to get rid of you and remove you and find a better Christian. He loves you. He doesn't want to upgrade you, but he does want to update you. He does want to make you aware of the condition of your soul and then download into you the newest update of compassion and love and commitment to Christ. He doesn't just want you to serve in church. He doesn't just want you to get involved. He doesn't just want you to give your money. He wants you to love him. And I pray in Jesus' name that you'll remember the way you used to be and your affection and that gratitude you had towards Jesus. And that today you'll repent and say, God, forgive me that I've allowed the good news to become old news. God, restore my soul. God, update my heart so that I love you the way that I did. And actually, God, I want to love you better than I did. An update is not meant to bring you back to where you were. An update is to help you get better. I want to love God more than I've ever loved him before. I, I want to serve him deeper with better motives. I don't just want to do good things. I want to love Jesus. And here John is reminding us that first we need to remember where we were. We need to repent and ask God to forgive us. And then third, we need to return. Read with me verse 5. Again, consider how far you have fallen. Repent and do the things you did at first. Do the things you did at first. Some of you might ask, well, how do I restore my passion that I used to have for God? Here's a start. Do the things you did at first. You used to pray all the time. Now it's when I find free time. You used to have a hunger to study His Word by yourself every day. Now it's, can't wait till Pastor Susie's next message. Every Saturday I get to learn God's Word. What about Sunday through Friday? What if we just did the things we did at first? What if we had the same gratitude that we had when we first stepped out of the darkness and into the light? What if we remembered the day one PS5 opening and we asked God to help us to love Him the way that we once did? What if we returned? Because that's our problem. We have turned. I said a portion of the word repentance means to ask God to forgive you. But really the word means to turn. By definition, that's what the word means. But not just a turn with your actions, it's a turning in your mind and in your soul. That I was walking with my PS4 and something else came by and I turned and took a second look. My eyes were taken off Jesus. My focus was removed. And I thought to myself, what if I just upgrade it? And you've already turned. Your eyes, your focus, your attention, your affection has been turned off Jesus. And here John is telling us to return back to him. Return back to our affection. And how do we do it? By doing the things we did at first. Are you still reading his word? Are you still spending time praying? Are you still rejoicing and reminding yourself that no matter who sits in office, Jesus still sits on the throne? Are you reminding yourself of these things? Are you doing what you did at first? Are you still hungry? Are you still seeking God? There was a time in your life where you, you wanted to tell everybody about Jesus. But then somewhere along the lines, you let enough people say no, stop you from continuing. What if you just went back to what you did at first, got hungry to tell people about Jesus, and said, God, I'm not responsible for their response. 
I'm just responsible to share. What if you did what you did at first? And you prayed and read his word and you got into an experience group and you got around good, godly Christian people and you decided that I was going to rejoice. You used to tell yourself, I will rejoice in God my Savior. But then somewhere along the line, 2020, just suck the life out of you. And my, my, my joy is gone. If you really grasp what it means to be saved and set free, forgiven of your sins, that I was once blind, but now I see that I was in darkness, destined to be far from God, but then he rescued me. There is nothing in this world that will be able to steal your joy. If you've really grasped the truth that you have been rescued by Jesus, it doesn't mean you'll never have a bad day. It doesn't mean that nothing will ever upset you, but it means that I've got a joy that surpasses all things the world throws at me because I love Jesus. So what's getting in the way of you loving Jesus more? What's that thing that's caused you to turn your eyes away from Christ? And Jesus today is calling you to return to your passion. Well, I don't need to return. I, I never left the church. No, no, no. You stayed in the building. You stayed in the stream. But your heart is somewhere else. Return, my children. Return, my sons and my daughters, who I love. Jesus is calling you to return your affection, your passion, and your love for who Jesus is. But in order to return your affection for Jesus, you might have to return your PS5. Something has gotten in the way of you loving Jesus deeper. The Bible would call it an idol. An idol in the Old Testament is something that they would worship instead of God. In today's world, it would be anything that you've allowed to take the place of God in your heart. And for some of you, it might be that PS5 that's on its way. For some of you, it might be a girlfriend. For some of you, it might be that RTX 3090. For some of you, it might be that new job. Whatever it might be. And for some of you, th there might be an idol in your life. Something's getting in the way. In order to return your love and your passion for Jesus, you might have to return it. In order for you to deeper and more passionately love Jesus, you've got to ask yourself, what's getting in the way? And it could be a good thing. I'm not wrong with the PS5. I'm getting one, praise God. But what is getting in the way? What's that thing that's causing you to turn back and look? That looks like an upgrade to me. That looks like something better, something more worth my time and my affection. What is it? Is it other people's approval of you? Is it your success? Is it your job? Is it your family? If I'll be honest, for me, sometimes it's work. I love to work. I just, I love it. I work too much for too many days and too many hours. I love to work. And I know that that sounds noble, but it's really not a good thing when work takes place of other things in your life. And for me, there are so many times where I'm spending so much time building the kingdom that sometimes I neglect just being with the king. And for some of us, church can be an idol. Your friends can be an idol. And we need to check our hearts and say, God, what have I allowed to take the place of you in my heart? What's it been? Because whatever it is, I might need to return it. I, mean, I might need to get it out. I might need to get it out. I might need to remove it. Otherwise, he will remove me. I need to return my affection for Jesus. I need my love to return before he does. I need my heart to be in the right place. I need to serve God. And I need to ask him, Lord, help me to return 
For some of you, it might be returning to a relationship with God altogether. Maybe you flat out did abandon Christ. Today, Jesus is calling you to return. But what happens more frequently than people leaving the church is actually people staying in church, but their heart is somewhere else. I'm in the building, just like the church of Ephesus. I'm enduring hardship. I'm doing all the good things. And God is proud, but something has taken my attention. It's taken my affection. What in your life has replaced God in your heart? Or just pushed him down a little bit. Because remember, remember the way you were when you first gave your life to follow Jesus. Acknowledge that this message could be for you. And repent and return. Return to the things you did at first. When you, you really gave your life to follow Jesus and you loved him, you served him, you didn't care what your friends thought, you didn't care what people thought about you, you just loved Jesus and you wanted everybody to know. I think Jesus would ask, what happened? What happened? I remember a day when you used to do this and feel this, but look at you today. And for all of us, including myself, I need to look a, take a close look at my own life and say, Jesus, even though I feel like I'm doing pretty well, I mean, I remember when I first got saved. I, I, I couldn't sleep without spending time in his presence. I, I couldn't go a single day without reading his word. And sometimes today I get so busy that I don't even realize that I didn't read it even cross my mind completely forgot about my king because I was too busy building his kingdom I remember I I, I couldn't see a human being without asking God I don't know how you're going to do it but open up a conversation with that guy and I get things are different in 2020 and there's physical barriers in place I get that but it doesn't change your heart and your intent and the things that you wish you could be doing if you could do them. What happened? And and I want to take a few minutes, all of us, and to allow you time to reflect and ask God, what happened? To remember, to repent, and to ask the Holy Spirit to help you return. And Amanda's going to sing a song, and I want to invite some of you to do something maybe that's brand new for you. I believe that Jesus Christ is our king and I am his servant and it is not the other way around. In a practice I want to encourage you to do in your life because maybe when you first got saved you did this. Maybe it was often that you got on your knees before your king. Maybe it was often that you bowed before him. But now you're like, man, I can't remember the last time I've done that. I can't remember the last time that I got on my knees before my master. And I invite some of you to get on your knees before God and say, God, help me to return. Help me to return to my love for Jesus. So as Amanda sings, I encourage you, whether you're home, here in person, I don't care where you are, I encourage you to bow your head, close your eyes, get on your knees and allow God to return your passion to him as Amanda sings. Through the way things appear 
to forgive us when we have just done good things but not had good motives we ask you today Lord to help us to remember who we once were I know in church we always use the phrase I'm not who I once was I've been saved, forgiven, set free and it's true we're not who we once were but God I know for my life that in terms of my affection and my love for Jesus, in some ways, God, I'm not who I once was. And we just ask you, Lord, to forgive us. Today, God, we repent. And we ask you, our King, to help return our love and our passion for you. God, help us to do the things we did at first. When we couldn't go a day without reading your word when we couldn't go a day without spending time in your presence when we could not lay our heads to the pillow without thanking Jesus for the cross forgive us God for allowing the good news to just become old news God we ask you today to do a heart check in all of us and to help us to have affection towards you to remember all the things you've done for us but not just to love you for what you've done but to love you for who you are you are king you are master you are God you are holy righteous perfect in all your ways and God we owe you everything everything but may we not just be a church that hits the goal of Waymaker Week May we be the church that loves Jesus. God forbid the day 
that we've gone from building the kingdom to building our egos. God forbid the day when we've gone from getting people saved to just playing it safe. We dedicate our lives, our affection, and our honor to King Jesus. And I pray right now, God, you instill in our hearts an update of love and compassion and authenticity and commitment to you. God forbid the days, Lord, where we feel like we've upgraded from you. Something new has taken our attention. Something new has taken our focus. And today, God, ask, we ask you to help us to love you and to return our hearts to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Maybe there are some of you today who all of this is brand new. You've never really been in church before. You've never really heard about some of the things we're talking about. You've heard about PS5, but you've never really heard the truth of what is the gospel. The good news of Jesus Christ, that for broken people like me and people just like you, all of us, no matter who you are, where you're watching from, what you've done, or where you've, what you've been through, the good news is that Jesus Christ died on the cross for me because I have sinned. The Bible says that all of us have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. I've been selfish. I've lied. I've manipulated. I've cheated. I am guilty. But God loved you and me so much that he gave his son Jesus Christ to die on the cross so that he would pay the penalty for the things that you and I have done. And three days later, Jesus Christ rose from the dead, showcasing that you can't upgrade from him. Nothing is better than Jesus. Nothing is stronger. Death can't hold him. He is God. And today, he invites you to have a relationship with him. The Bible says that all who will believe in their heart and confess with their mouth that you can be saved. And today, if you're here, and you've never made a decision to follow Jesus. You've never made a decision to follow Jesus. I want to encourage you today to pray this prayer with me. As you take that first step of saying yes to follow Jesus. But it's got to be real. We talked about all through this message how in church we can do good things but not love Jesus. You can say these words and it means nothing. But I pray that you'll say them in your heart and in your soul as you make a decision to make a commitment to follow Christ. And I pray that today that, that that's you. And if that's you, I encourage you to repeat these words and pray this prayer with me. And God, I thank you that you sent your son Jesus to die on the cross for me. And I ask you today, God, to forgive me of my sins. And I invite you to be my Lord and my Savior. Thank you today, God, that I begin a journey of knowing Christ. And we thank you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. Ladies and gentlemen, will you put some hype in the chat and praise God for people that are saying yes to follow Jesus?